Hi, everyone. So get used to my voice. You're going to hear it throughout the day. Um, I'm your resident traffic cop. I'm just going to let you know when presenters are coming up, a little more about workshops. First, just really quickly, because we're short on time, just wanted to chat about the seed money, because obviously everyone wants to know about that. Um, so basically, we decided to award equal batches of seed money to the projects that um, you, the attendees, consider the most worthy of funding. Um, you should have received three ballots and a piece of paper with the list of presenters, and each presenter has a number by their name. That's the most important part. Um, and to vote, you just simply write down the number on the ballot and then drop it into the ballot box. You see Emma at the welcome table. She, it's under the welcome table. Um, yeah, you can just meet Emma um, with your ballots. Drop them in, and you can vote for one person for three ballots. You know, mix it up. Whatever you want to do, it's up to you. Um, and then winners will be announced at the end of the day after we tab tabulate all the votes. Got it? Pretty simple. All right, I'm going to get right down to it um, because I don't want to waste any more time of you guys just listening to me. Um, so our first presenter will be Alexander, and he's going to be presenting on energy we need. Welcome, Alexander. that sorry thing um, and so in, in that vein to sort of support that type of momentum um, okay, it's not hello um, can I, did everybody hear what I was saying before okay well so what I hear today is that we're here to make like a regional movement because we need that kind of scale to achieve um, efficiency and the, and the momentum that we need to sort of move this along. And so a, a couple of years ago, I read a book by David McKay to calculate your lifestyle's energy consumption. And so I built, I, I built a model in Excel and then I got a programmer to make uh, this website. So essentially, um, I'm going out of order. What you can do is that you can enter and you can calculate your entire energy consumption of every aspect of your lifestyle so that you can know exactly which part of your lifestyle is consuming the most energy. So you can see that transportation, because I'm from Denmark and I fly intercontinentally, that's probably the biggest one. And so um, you can basically go through and like these drop downs show you, they have all the information to calculate your energy consumption is like, it's super easy. Anyone can do it. You don't have to do any research. I've done like a year and a half worth of research to do it. And then the next page, you have your savings commitments that you can commit to, various things that you can do to reduce your energy consumption. Because, I mean, we know we need efficiency, we need renewables, but at the same time, we also need to practice what we preach. And so we need to be able to cut down our, our, our consumption right now, at least in the short term, before we achieve that conversion to make our, our energy renewably. Um, and so the goal of the website was to have data visualizations that can support people like a student a group, a college, uh, inter-college competitions can be supported with like data visualization. So here's a group of 134 members on a map. And here is a, this is their total, an individual, and then you have equivalent units. And there's actually a bunch of other equivalent units. It'll tell you how many cups of coffee you could make with the same energy, how many laptops you could have on each day. So here, this 134 people can consume, or they could have 30,000 laptops on all day, every day of the year, with the amount of energy that they consume. So these are sort of like to put CO2 and other, other units into perspective. And then this, I, I sort of made a model based on the Kyoto or various scientific benchmark limits for uh, CO2 emissions. And so this shows that even with 36% reduction of my energy, I still need to reduce 30% more to achieve that scientifically recommended cap. And we're, uh, as we learned before, we're still going to be 25% risk of exceeding or of having like severe climate disruptions. So that's basically it. I don't know if I'm 
if I went too quickly, but um, okay, great. Um, well, you might. Oh, I'm gonna mess it up. So this is the website, and you can sort of hear on the planes. You should be able to see. This is some other equivalent units for that population. This sort of just shows how easy it is to have these data visualizations. And this is supposed to sort of make it rewarding for somebody to enter this data. And then you could use these data visualizations at campaigns, for example, if you went to um, a, a summit, a climate summit, like there's a UN climate summit coming up in September, and if you could go to the table where they, they want everyone to make commitments, they want businesses, industry leaders, uh, governments to make commitments, if you can come there as civil society and tell them, listen, this is what we're doing right now, you know, and you're going to be responsible for setting in regulations to increase renewables, you're going to be responsible for forcing industry and for compelling business to like do things efficiently, then you could sort of go to the table and you could sort of peer pressure them, for lack of a better word, to sort of step up the same way that you are stepping up now. So that was sort of one of my big ideas behind, behind having these data visualizations. And I um, actually just got invited to the sixth, last sentence, sixth annual climate summit in Reykjavik to present this. So it would be really cool if we could sort of get a whole group of people together to make this kind of like statement with these visualizations and then I could present it there or do something like that. So hopefully this will help you build momentum. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Alexander. I hope all of you know the way that this day is going as far as presentations, just kind of flash presentations, five minutes everybody gets. Um, so we'll move right along to Katie, who is presenting on home composting. And just this quick note to presenters, make sure you're looking in the back at Emma. She's our other traffic cop. She's letting you know how much time you have left. Okay, so Katie. I'm Katie. I'm going to do a little presentation today on home composting. Hello? Better? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, what is composting? Well, according to Google, to make vegetable matter or manure into compost. Got it? That's a pretty crude definition, but not a terrible start. So, moving right along. According to a more reputable source, composting is controlled decomposition the natural breakdown process of organic residues. Composting transforms raw organic waste materials into biologically stable substances that make excellent soil amendments. So why compost? Um, compost adds nutrients to your soil, increases the fertility of your plants. It also increases, uh, improves the biological, chemical, and physical characteristics of your soil. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, people who actively compost use up to 50% less fertilizer than those who do not compost. It decreases the amount of kitchen waste that you have and ultimately um, decreases the amount of landfill waste. So what should you compost? Um, soil requires two basic elements. Yes, you require a television network to compost. No, C is for carbon and N is for nitrogen. So what is nitrogen rich? We've got any sort of fruits and vegetables from your kitchen in addition to egg cell, eggshells, they're a good source of nitrogen. In addition to tea bags, grass clippings and flowers. Coffee grinds and cow chicken and pig manure are also good sources. Uh, nitrogen provides raw materials that are necessary for making enzymes, which is why it's essential to composting. Now we move on to carbon. What's got carbon? Leaves, pine needles, corn stalks, and hay. Um, carbon gives your compost that light, fluffy body. Two-thirds of your compost pile 
should be carbon, which helps mask the smell of anaerobic materials that are nitrogen rich and smelly. More carbon, you can do sawdust, cardboard, newspaper, and tree bark if you wanna go for more mulchy compost. So what not to compost? This is almost as important as what you should compost. You don't wanna put any meat, uh, bones, or fish in your compost pile because it attracts pests. Cute critter or compost criminal? <laughs> Do not compost pet manure. Um, don't put your dog or cat feces in your composting, especially if you're gonna look to grow food stuff. Um, stick to the cow, chicken, or hog manure. Um, you also don't wanna compost peels or rinds that might have pesticides on them. Better to be safe and sorry. You don't wanna end up contaminating your whole, your whole pile. Also, a not so obvious thing you shouldn't compost are diseased plants that can also contaminate your whole pile. <laughs> Don't ruin your whole thing, just keep them out of there. So, <laughs> how to get started. First thing you wanna do is buy a container. You can buy some nifty ones off the internet, rotating compost tumblers, or just do what I did and use an old kitchen garbage can. Optional, you can add worms to your compost, this is called vermicomposting. The two worms best suited are red wiggler and lumbricus rubellus, which speed the rate of composting and may consume weed seeds and pathogens. You wanna keep your compost covered. It needs to be warm and moist for maximum productivity. Too much rain is bad and can make your compost soggy. Lastly, you wanna make sure you turn your compost. Turning allows your compost to aerate. Oxygen is necessary for decomposition. You wanna do this every few weeks and rotating compost tumblers make this step easy. Finally, you wanna repeat these steps, continue adding material in a two to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, maintain heat and moisture levels and aerate your pile. That's my presentation. Here are a few fun facts you guys can read through and that's about it. Alrighty, thank you so much, Katie. Moving right along, our next presenters will be Allison, Stephen, and jo Joel, or Joel, Joel, Joel. Okay, presenting on project P-O-L-Y-P. So let's go, Stephen. Hi, I'm Hi everyone, uh, my name is Allison Marr and I'm a BAFA student here at the New School, uh, Design and Technology and Environmental Studies are my two majors. Uh, I'm Steven, I'm BAFA as well. I'm in Product and Environmental Studies. Awesome. All right, so we're currently working on a polyp, um, the redesign of the New York City trash receptacle lid and we will be putting um, this working prototype this summer in the Rockaway Beach, so. All right, so we had two goals uh, for Polyp, and that is to create um, trash cans that do what they're meant to do, um, to hold waste effectively, both for public health and sanitation, as well as the health of the surrounding wildlife. So here we have some existing trash receptacles. You can see um, they're normally overfilled. Um, they're not sorted. You might have to touch them, which no one really wants to do. Um, a lot of them, I'm sure you've seen, are naked. There's only just a plastic bag lining it. And it's really easy for animals and the wind to move these, move our trash around, and that's not what we want to do. Um, so we're concerned mainly with high traffic public spaces where, oh, is that the next slide? Oh, oh no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we, um, are mainly focused with high traffic public spaces, such as Far Rockaway Beach. And this is where synanthropic animals, such as seagulls, nor like regularly consume human food scraps and packaging, and that's not okay. This is where we come in. So basically, um, the inspiration for the new uh, trash can receptacle lid comes from uh, anemones, where 
uh, anemones are able to grab hold of things and then take it in and not allow uh, uh, the sand, grit, and other things to be um, to come into its system. So when we were designing this, uh, the polyp, that's what we called it, we wanted to simplify functions for uh, human use, uh, human intuitive use, and also it should be made with bright colors and moving appendages to deter scavengers. Um, some ideation sketches of how it should be put together, manufactured, and then what it, how it's going to be manufactured and put together. So it'll be um, two molds, um, one for the round piece and one for the um, outer rim, and then it'll be all put together at once. So then you don't have like a giant mold or you won't have uh, a lot of welding for the metal existing lids. So we also propose um, kind of three different uh, ways of disposal. So then um, that way we can tackle the issue of uh, the overflowing problem. So uh, theoretically, when you have three and you, you know, source them properly and outsource them properly, you probably have a third less of the trash and um, less animals will get to it. So to scale model, and this is what we're going to propose. Um, so basically, um, in the summer, we're planning to implement a uh, full-scale version of this at the Rockaway Beach Park, and then we're gonna do uh, first-hand account research. Uh, we're gonna talk to the residents there and see how they respond to the um, trash can receptacle lid. And we're also going to study the ecological, urban ecological effects it has on seagull populations, other scavenging animals, and also human-seagull interactions, um, as well as the waste disposal systems, so, yeah. Um, and as a side note, this um, we noticed while doing this project that it doesn't need to be site specific. Um, it could be applied towards all waterfront parks in public spaces. So it doesn't really have to be just for the Rockaway Beach Park. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you, Stephen and Allison. Our final presenter in this block will be Brittany, and she will be presenting on Free New. Wow, that looks pretty good on the big screen. Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Bolenbeck. Um, I am a student at SUNY Purchase College, I'm about to graduate this May. Um, and we've been talking a lot about waste and kind of recycling so far um, in this first half of the present of the uh, of this conference. So if I could just get a little bit of community engagement and snap with me. If you generally like free stuff, if it's in good condition and no, no strings attached, no like 7% interest for the next three years. Um, so obviously, as long as it's in good condition, uh, I think most of us can agree that we do like free stuff. So Free New is a project that reduces and recycles, whoops, that reduces and recycles end of the year waste uh, on college campuses. Uh, we store it during the summer um, on, our st on our college campus in these uh, storage units. These are called pods. Um, and then we give it back to the student body at the beginning of fall semester completely free. Um, <laughs> so the World Watch Institute recently released research that stated our projected annual municipal solid waste, or MSW, generation levels can double within 11 years. That's 1.3 billion tons per year to 2.6 billion tons per year. This is definitely a, a, an issue that we all need to start addressing as the future leaders of the world. So um, a small group of students got together um, uh, to try and solve this problem and find a solution to end this waste, wasteful cycle at the end of the year when students throw out tons of items. Um, it's been mainly funded by a grant derived from the mandatory student activity fee called the Green Fee Fund Grant, which is an allocation of $30,000 uh, through the MSAF. Um, and so we identified three common problems associated with the recycling um, uh, projects and in order to hopefully establish a solution. So obviously, this is what we're dealing with. <laughs> problem. 
And so uh, we needed to address it. And we're trying to stick to the three R's of environmentalism, reducing our waste at the end of the semester, reusing those discarded items for students, uh, incoming students, and recycling what we can if we do have leftovers. We have literally diverted thousands of items from ending in landfills. Um, and in about 50 years, we have started to generate uh, over a little over two and a half pounds more uh, waste generation per day than we have in the past uh, 50 years. So, very worrisome. Um, another problem that most colleges have that SUNY Purchase um, is a little bit of an exception. I know it's definitely not a, a city school, um, but we have no space on our campus. We have no extra dorms or rooms or closets that we can store our items in. And so we decided to use that mandatory student activity fee money and rent these units. On the right, you see pods, portable on-demand storage systems. We've been using that in the past to store items. And this year, we're using mobile minis, which are 25-foot-long um, containers, which are twice as big as the, the largest pod that we could get. So hopefully this year will be the bigger, biggest and best year ever. Um, this is also my senior thesis, so I'm really excited to finish it off. <laughs> So obviously, this, semester, this program operates at the very end of the spring semester. And what do we all have at the end of the semester? All right, cool. So obviously, you're trying to find a summer job. You're applying for grad school. You're about to graduate. You're doing a lot of things. A lot of things are going on. So we had to figure out a way to incentivize students to show up for their shifts. To, uh, we asked them to work two-hour shifts. We paid them a certain stipended amount. Um, they would be organizing all of the donations, cleaning them, and documenting them into these units. Um, and this also helps build accountability. We have quote-unquote pod masters in the past, and this year we have mini masters. And those are the students who are working closely with whoever the free new organizer is on that campus. They, um, they kind of shadow whoever that organizer is and uh, have additional responsibilities in, in, uh, in lieu of just packing the items into the, the storage containers. So if you guys are interested or ladies and gentlemen are interested um, or have new experiences or ideas to share uh, and talk about this problem or even bring this pro uh, project to your campus, I'd love to talk to you more. I do have a table on the your right um, over there later. Uh, and we do have a business plan that we created in my junior year, so I'm really excited to share that with some other folks. So please contact me at any one of those four five options. Um, I did, I guess I have a little bit of time in the back, right? Uh, all right, cool. So if there, if I could take like a question, if anybody had a question or a comment, I would love to open this up. Um, how many college campuses are you currently operating on? Oh, this is currently just at SUNY Purchase College. Uh, part of my thesis was to extend it to another college campus. We're starting to work with the University of Buffalo um, and some students over there. Yeah. One more, maybe? No? Okay. We do have some time, and we're going to open it up after for some more questions uh, okay. from the previous two. So, yeah, your question is welcome. <clears throat> have you ever thought about selling this stuff? Like Yes. Yes, and actually that's a really good conversation I'd love to have later on. We are actually part of a network called PLAN, the Post Landfill Action Network, which act it was a similar project to Freenew that operates in the University of New Hampshire. Um, and they actually sell this, the items back to students at a very, very discounted rate, so you could get a really nice couch for five bucks or a wall mirror for two dollars or something like that. We've thought about it, um, and I would really love to do that as an ad added gener uh, rent revenue generation. But I just, <laughs> I don't have time at the moment uh, to kind of coordinate that. But that's something, if there was more than one person per campus to do this project, you know, it would be a little bit bigger. Rachel? Hi, Rachel. Hi. What was the biggest challenge that you overcame in developing the implementing free Administration, uh, first of all. Uh, finding funding. Uh, the Green Fee Fund, even though it is a student pool of money, it's controlled by the administration. And unfortunately, they're not as lenient as we would like them to be as uh, most times. But since this is the third year we've been doing this program, they have really started to like, oh, you're doing a good job. And they've given us a little bit more money uh, recently. I think I'm probably out of time, but let's talk later. I would love to have a conversation with you all. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much.
All right, I just want to do one more round of applause for all those presenters. They were awesome. They were really good. <laughs>